tonight. Um, tonight I want to talk about um, how what we ate became truly global food waste. And it was not only the globalization of food, of course, but also values and um, beliefs at the very core of what we eat and the meals we share as a community, both at sea and on land. We are what we eat, the French philosopher said. So in the Atlantic world, um, where I've worked for much of my career, one of the earliest uh, crucibles of globalization, the Caribbean, the peoples, the cultures, the foods of all the continents came together. North and South America, Eurasia and Africa mixed and met um, with some, I think, good flavors uh, resulting from that meeting. So we'll start our voyage tonight, um, and I really do feel like I'm at the helm of a ship here. I know that's <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, we'll start our voyage tonight in the Atlantic, for that reason. Um, the Caribbean as the focus of my most recent book um, on global foods, and, and then move on to other watery realms, including the Great Lakes of Michigan, um, where I was born, um, and uh, which is the subject of my next project. Um, we'll also go to the Pacific, um, to the islands of Hawaii, um, otherwise known as the Sandwich Islands, and back to Coos Bay. Um, with a few recipes in between, and I'll talk about um, those a little bit more at the end if you have some questions. I love this quote by Olauda Ekiano, who was a Nigerian. Um, he was born in Africa, and um, he actually was uh, enslaved, he was kidnapped, uh, and he wrote about his experience in an autobiographical work that was also uh, an abolitionist treatise. Um, and he writes, and I'll, I'll read the, a little bit fuller um, passage here. During our passage, I first saw flying fishes, which surprised me very much. They used frequently to fly across the ship, and many of them fell on the deck. The clouds appeared to me to be land, which disappeared as they passed along. This heightened my wonder, and I was now persuaded more than ever that I was in another world, and that everything about me was magic. So, I think this wonderful quote um, su quite suggests magic, um, and perhaps justifies some of the fear and even trepidation about uh, going on out to sea, um, with which early travelers ventured. Um, the, the early maritime world, of course, was a magical world, not only because fish could fly. This quote from the autobiography of uh, Gustavus Vasa, as he was known in his lifetime, uh, who lived between 1745 and 1797, um, describes the experience of being on a ship for the first time. Um, and he also goes on and describes in great detail some of the food and meals that um, he was fed as an enslaved African in the 18th century. So originally enslaved in West Africa, he was actually released from slavery. He was manumitted um, by his owner, who was Robert King, a Quaker. Um, who taught him to read and to write, and um, <coughs> then used him in his business transactions, and eventually sold him his freedom. Echiano spent the rest of his life in London, um, uh, and uh, the rest of his life um, uh, pretty much at sea, uh, but based in London. So he was a seafarer, a merchant, an abolitionist, an explorer himself. So what made Echiano want to return to the sea? Was it the food? Probably not. So I'm going to look at the food, um, beginning with the time of Columbus, uh, de Caramosto, 
made the, uh, actually two voyages to Africa in the 15th century. Um, Columbus too went to West Africa, and many people don't realize that he was quite a traveler before he went to, all the way across the Atlantic. Um, but he and other ship captains uh, routinely believed that there were mermaids and mermen um, that one could observe, and Captain Christopher Columbus himself claimed to have seen three such creatures off the coast of Hispaniola in the Caribbean in 1493. And he wrote about them. He said, they came quite high out of the water. Such sightings were not, not enough to detour uh, the sailors uh, and even earlier Viking sailors and probably Basque fishermen had reached out across the Atlantic. So Columbus wasn't by any means the first. Um, others probably half a millennium, 500 years earlier before Columbus um, had made uh, some of that, that passage possible. So, from these northern reaches, um, where Basque fishermen, where um, uh, some of the European sailors had ventured, um, fishermen provided Europe with a pretty steady supply of dry and salted uh, codfish. And later, the codfish, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about, um, was introduced to enslaved Africans uh, aboard the slave ships. Salted cod became a staple food in New World cuisines after 1492. And um, has anyone here eaten salted cod? Yes. Um, you can buy it. I don't know where you can buy it locally. You can buy it in Portland at Asian markets, at um, Caribbean, Cuban, West African markets, typically. Um, and uh, for a small box, it's, it's about 13, 12, 13 dollars. Later, the codfish, uh, when it was introduced to the enslaved African, it ended up becoming the food of the West Indies, and I'll, I'll speak about that in just a moment. Um, the popular presence of cod, both in European religious foods, uh, remember that Many Europeans are practicing Catholics at this time and, and are, um, you know, their foods are restricted on holy days, on Fridays, nobody eats anything but fish, um, no red meat, etc. So fish was a very important part of the diet and especially for people who lived inland and not on the sea, who weren't fisher, fishing people themselves, um, the salted cod that was preserved was extremely important. So the voyages of Columbus, we can say, initiated what has been called the Columbian Exchange. This was an exchange of foods, uh, primarily, um, also diseases on, on seen uh, uh, sailors on, on ships, uh, but mostly foods which were very importantly transferred between the two hemispheres. Uh, the Afro-Eurasian world on the other side of the Atlantic and the Americas here, North and South America. So of course, uh, the Americans had their supply of travel provisions here already, and prominent was um, the journey cake, uh, made of pounded corn and other plants, um, also pemmican and related cakes, very extremely high protein, um, very healthy foods, each made with pounded foods of various sorts, sometimes pounded berries, uh, cranberries, blueberries, etc., huckleberries, um, small smoked and salted and dried fish. Um, in the Andes, it was the potatoes that were um, very important, uh, to name just a few of the different kinds of travelers' foods that were already here in the Western Hemisphere. Without these provisions, of course, made available to European ships, uh, sometimes as gifts, sometimes being sold to the European ships, um, there would have been no successful European voyages for us historians to talk about. Um, so in addition to the European style dry provisioned foods, there were also foods that they learned and picked up um, in the various ports as they moved around. Food, water, wood, um, these were all very essential commodities for the voyages um, along the way. And what stands out in, in maritime accounts, of course, are these stations for finding provisions. And um, from the second century right to present day, 
this, this knowledge of the sea really meant knowledge of the ports where various foods were available. So when Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, the Atlantic crossing was hardly a voyage to be remembered for its culinary delights. Uh, the sailors on board the three ships were served a very monotonous diet, uh, typical of late 15th century seafaring. The basic food stuff, and I've given you the recipe if you want to try it and see how bad it really could be, <laughs> was that horrid but essential sea biscuit. Um, the sea biscuit, or hard tack, is a twice-baked bread, typically of wheat flour, that became so hard and so infested with weevils or peoples um, that its consumption could really become nearly as dangerous as the alternative of persistent hunger and um, uh, the discomforts of being at sea without and their food and water. Indeed, wrote the Admiral's son, uh, that is Columbus's uh, son, who was on one of the voyages, he said, quote, and what with the heat and the dampness even the sea biscuit was so full of worms that, God help me, I saw many wait until nightfall to eat the porridge made of it so as not to see the worms. So, not so, not so great, this cuisine of the maritime world. Notwithstanding the critics of maritime cuisines, um, these ships' biscuits would eventually be mass-produced. You know, if it's bad, let's make it even worse. <laughs> um, the uh, Royal Navy's bake houses produced, um, for every single sailor, about a pound per day of sea biscuits in the 18th century. The weevils didn't disappear, and they would be known affectionately as bargemen because they, rode, they floated on the tops of the soups and the stews like <laughs> Europeans clung to their consumption of wheat, however, and sea biscuits became an essential ingredient of various maritime dishes. So lobscouse, that was the maritime hash. Um, in the French world, uh, the pan de mer, or the, the bread of the sea, hard tack, in other words, um, eventually would be produced as a colonial food using steam-powered flour mills uh, in France. So this idea of the sea biscuit wasn't very tasty, it didn't hold up all that well, but it was, um, it did spread. At the start of his voyages, Columbus took on barrels of the biscuits then. Uh, at this time they were produced by Genoa bakers in Italy, um, and in addition to the biscuits, he had red wine, he had water, the water didn't last very long and it tasted pretty horribly um, uh, by um, a month or so into the voyage. Um, he had olives. He had olive oil. He had uh, goat cheese from the Canary Islands. He had honey. He had raisins, garlic, almonds, various dry beans, uh, chickpeas, lentils, black-eyed peas. Um, he had tough, salted, pickled pork and beef which was the other staple that I'm going to be talking quite a bit about. Uh, he had salted sardines and dried salt cod. So the crew supplemented their preserved meat ration on board, um, often by purchasing rats. Every ship had a rat catcher called Miller's. Um, from the ship's rat catcher, um, they supplemented their food by catching flying fish and sharks when waters were calm enough to do so, uh, by capturing the pretty generally detestable seabirds. They were quite oily, apparently. I have not tried them. Um, when finally they came close enough to shore uh, to, to find seabirds, of course. So we not only rely, as historians, on lists of provisions like these from the captain's accounts or one of the um, officer's accounts, but in addition, historians have closely examined uh, the culinary remains of sunken ships. And um, many of these uh, archaeological remains give us you know, new clues into um, what people ate and, 
how they ate it. For example, the Mary Rose, um, which was a ship that sank in 1545, um, contained hard biscuit, um, salted meat, peas, hard salted cheese, and presumably a lot of drowned rats. More than 200 years later, the rations at sea, the daily rations, differed only slightly. So it was a pretty constant diet. Hard biscuit, peas, salted fish, meat, butter, cheese, oatmeal, beer sometimes, uh, wine, brandy. Still the fate of every sailor on board um, His Majesty's ships in 1815. So all the way from Columbus into the 19th century. Now the food tended to be stored in the driest part of the dam and King Ships hold, um, and sea biscuits often in sacks. Um, people didn't quite understand that um, those sea biscuits might absorb uh, the humidity at sea. Uh, ovens were set in sand um, in an open firebox on board the, the ship. Uh, so, since there was no chimney, usually the flavors of almost everything tasted kind of dark and uh, smoky. Uh, food was mostly boiled in large copper kettles, and by the 17th century, mid 17th century, most of those copper kettles were supplied by the Dutch, and the Dutch made a fortune um, off of selling people kettles, and um, not only for uh, cooking at sea, but cooking in various uh, settlements as people spread around the world. Um, they were served to sailors in large wooden bowls, um, communal bowls, typically, and meals were usually eaten by hands, uh, not with forks and spoons. Uh, so each Spanish sailor carried a personal knife, for example, um, large enough to cut pieces of meat, which were relatively rare. Um, but even in the 19th century, metal knives and spoons uh, were still prohibited by the, the Navy, by the British Navy anyway, um, which feared disgruntled uh, crew members use of them as weapons. So people ate tin cups, cups of various sorts with wooden um, spoons, carved wooden spoons, um, and uh, typically ate in groups. Um, some of the military aspects of this maritime uh, communal meal carried over to places like logging camps and mining camps, uh, which we see emerge in America in the, in the 19th century. Um, but they had very strict rules often, um, at least the ones that I've encountered in the Great Lakes area, um, as they were cutting the forests um, there, um, the men would have lunches that they took away from the camp, but when they came back in the evening, they had meals together, but they had to be absolutely quiet during meals, no talking during meals. So the meals were very fast, they ate very quickly, they couldn't, they didn't have time to get into arguments, and no food fights. Um, they ate that, that final dinner meal, went to bed and got up the next morning. Columbus landed in the Indies on his first voyage, um, and in Haiti on his second, where he discovered a great thing, a pepper, a type of pepper we know today, the chili pepper. Um, many new foods then came to Europe from the newly discovered lands in the West. And you can kind of see the two arrows going back and forth. Um, this Colombian exchange was a mutual experience. Um, so maize and potatoes and chocolate and vanilla, and tomatoes, and pineapples, all went from the New World to Eurasia for the very first time. So imagine Italian food with no tomatoes. <laughs> Not until after the time of Columbus. And even then, many of the foods, um, people were very um, hesitant about trying. Pineapples uh, were especially, people were very fearful of them. And, and even things like chocolate um, were touted as um, either aphrodisiacs or um, uh, very um, um, important and expensive medicines. Um, so often the royalty, the elites, were the first to try many of these foods, and they sought after them. They became 
elite, um, elite foods initially. Uh, the turkey arrived in Europe in around 1523, 1524. Um, the potato reached England about the same time in the late 1500s. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, how were these really gastronomic voyages, um, and what did it mean uh, to uh, have these foods, the seeds, the plants, moving across the waters? Um, but not only the foods themselves, but the meanings Foods, um, often new inventions, um, sometimes new uses um, would, would um, part of the body. So, sailing with cod, sailing with salted cod. Um, the most magical of all foods was the salted codfish. Um, the trade in salted cod was especially lucrative because of the 200 or more species of Atlantic codfish were so abundant, they were, um, could very easily and successfully be um, preserved. And here you see the drawing of cod on the ground. Um, this is a 19th century image, uh, and the codfish being spread out um, in very quite large um, uh, pieces. They, people describe them as um, feeling like planks of wood. They were so hard. Um, they, the cod eventually, of course, became a Christian symbol. Uh, it was an ancient sign of membership in the faith and associated with baptismal immersion in water. Um, and while the Vikings and the Norsemen had hung the fish out to dry in the frosty winter air, um, allowing it to become very durable um, and to be chewed on, this, essentially, the masks, on the other hand, salt the cod before drying uh, with pretty much the same result that uh, it lasted much longer than most men in sea. So salted cod uh, was a symbol both of departure and of travel. Uh, most codfish live in cold waters and in fact they spawn more specifically where warmer, uh, more tropical waters meet those cold waters. Um, in the in the Atlantic. So, um, for example, where the Gulf Stream mingles with the Arctic and Labrador waters. Um, so the maritime search for codfish preceded the voyages of Columbus and lasted well into the 20th century. And eventually, this codfish trade would support the purchase of enslaved Africans, who ironically would be fed with salted codfish as a mainstay of slave food. Um, in the Caribbean, the older French word meaning uh, guru, meaning prostitute, is used to describe codfish. Uh, the Portuguese bacalao, or Spanish bacalao, um, saltfish, as salted cod came to be known on Anglophone islands, um, also carried double meanings of sexuality, um, as well as um, secular meanings. Uh, and salted cod was used not only in European um, uh, culinary patterns of uh, eating uh, food, salted, um, sorry, eating of fish on holy days, um, but it was also used in African-derived uh, ceremonies as well, and eventually, eventually became the national dish of Jamaica. So he restored the salted cod by soaking it in warm water or cold water, um, sometimes boiling it briefly um, to remove some of the salt. Um, and the fleshy but preserved codfish flakes apart then and becomes tender like fresh fish. Um, then you further enliven the fish uh, with sauces of each cook's uh, choosing, a kind of symbolic um, but secular transmutation. So this idea of this hard salted codfish was brought was being brought back to life by the cook. So the growth of the Atlantic slave trade parallels the growth in salted cod. Um, you need cod and you need salt. Um, Africans, it turns out, were um, highly skilled and experienced in producing salt. And um, so Eventually, the salted cod, which became 
quote, meat of all the slaves in all West Indies, as one uh, observer noted uh, in the 17th century, in the Caribbean, men are so intent upon planting sugar, the other white substance, that they had rather buy food at very dear rates than produce it by labor. So infinite is the profit that sugar works. So having this preserved food, the salted cod, allowed the sugar industry to grow. So alongside sugar, you had to be producing salt because you needed the salt for the preservation of meats. Salted cod could be sold to African ports or to merchants uh, on the Caribbean islands in exchange for salt, in exchange for molasses, made from, uh, uh, sorry, in exchange for sugar, um, in exchange for molasses or slaves, um, and sometimes it was sold legally, sometimes as contraband. It was consumed on plantations, on ships. The preserved cod became a mainstay of maritime and slave diets. And not only salted cod, but also pickerel, pickled fish, filled in for the chronic scarcity of fresh and tender flesh in newborn diets. In parts of New England, then, nearly half of the population between the ages of 16 and 45 years of age were engaged in fishing and processing of fish, uh, which essentially took place in floating fish factories. So you have ships with um, air and space for drying uh, the salted, uh, processing it and, and salting the cod. Um, some 45% of all exports went to the West Indies, um, and it was known as Jamaican or Barbados cod. The inferior trash fish was smaller, broken, imperfectly processed, only partially dried, and oversalted for humid tropical conditions. Um, so this was very maligned fish, and it was traded for another foodstuff, the valuable molasses. Um, in turn, molasses then would be brought back um, to New England, and there it was made into rum in distilleries in Rhode Island and Boston and other places. Uh, the rum then would turn around and go back across the Atlantic uh, and soon joined um, other goods in uh, West Africa as local currencies, essentially. The voyage itself was far from pleasant, um, as we all know. Uh, food was also a commodity that could be traded for slaves themselves. So once, once the ships reached Africa, um, the transactions brought profits, and they brought profits then on all sides of this uh, equation. So for example, uh, on the eighth day of June in 1733, a New England ship anchored along the African coast bought a man boy for two pieces of cloth, three pounds of sugar, two and a quarter barrels of gunpowder, and 93 gallons of rum. Uh, this was at the old port uh, on a model. So the rum had come back across. Uh, that rum, of course, was produced by slaves on sugar islands, and in exchange for the rum, new slaves were brought across the Atlantic, put on plantations, producing the molasses, which was then sent to New England, so this was the, essentially the, the triangular trade. Codfish traveled on these ships, um, feeding sailors and slaves alike. Uh, so essentially the cod became a symbol of capitalism, and its image adorned state seals, town emblems, postage stamps, coins, um, every sort of public and private furnishing in North America, just as the known world doubled in size during the 16th century, the amount of codfish caught and exported increased by fivefold thereafter. So this global appetite for the salty fare was born in the slave trade. Um, African salt harvesting, of course, was very important. You see here, um, it was both uh, mined in the desert, in the Sahara, and also uh, evaporated in very complex um, processes uh, along the coast. Um, these techniques were then brought to the Caribbean. Um, 
There's a big Cargill uh, salt plant uh, in, um, in the Caribbean still today. And beginning about in, around the 15th century, the Portuguese uh, it's likely observed Africans producing salt, brought that experienced labor into the Caribbean, put them at work in the Bahamas, um, on the island, uh, island of Inagua, uh, which is uh, the southernmost piece of land in the Bahamas. Um, you have millions of pounds of salt still recovered annually uh, from salt, the salt ponds there. So this, these are pools of captured seawater evaporating in the sun and then being raked um, uh, into overnight and then melts during the day and, and repeated raking produces the salt crystals, leaving behind this kind of crystallized bed of salt. Um, this salt production took place in Jamaica, in the Turks and Caicos, and Willa, Tortuga, all of the islands which eventually become also important in the production of sugar and uh, you know, exasperated the demand for slave labor and kept the slave trade going into the 19th century. Um, so their proximity to cod fishing, of course, um, the regions of the North Atlantic made these islands a very valuable possession. So cooking was salt, salt cod or salt fish. Um, no food represented this magical art of preservation any more than salted codfish. Um, the really ubiquitous recipes of early sailing days have numerous versions of salted fish, whether it was Basque or Portuguese or Italian or English tables on land, on you know, aboard ships, salted codfish uh, was prepared in basically the same way um, throughout the 15th and 16th century. That wooden plank of fish, the dried fish, um, almost 80% of it was protein by the time it was all dried. Um, extremely um, healthy in that sense. Um, and once boiled, you could remove much of the salt, enough, but leave enough for uh, the flavor. Um, boil it to remove the salt, the skin, the bones, to rejuvenate the, the fish's uh, flavorful and uh, flaky texture. Then the white fish is typically um, stewed or uh, made into fritters. And I've given you a recipe for the fritters, which are, um, are wonderful. Um, but if you fry it, it's olive oil and onion and pepper, um, sometimes a sauce with ginger, egg yolks, milk, um, with butter, with parsley, with pieces of potatoes. Um, Caribbean cooks added lime juice and tomatoes and various kinds of peppers. Um, often replacing olive oil or butter, which they couldn't get, which didn't last in those tropical climates with uh, palm oil or coconut oil. Uh, some went a step further and made small fried fish cakes or dumplings or fritters. And in Jamaica, this is uh, sometimes called stamp and go. Um, the idea that you, you, um, you know, push the, the little cake down into quick fritter that, that can quickly uh, go on the road. It's the ultimate uh, traveling food. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the, it became the national dish along with uh, saltfish and aki. Aki was, um, neither of which of course were native to the island, but aki was a poisonous fruit that uh, came from West Africa. It was poisonous if you picked it at the wrong moment and often slave cooks would purposely uh, poison the slave masters by uh, giving them aki. So it, it has this era, um, sort of aura, I should say, of a resistance, part of resistance history. And um, the codfish then um, being sweet and the, the aki is a rather bland, uh, bland fruit. Um, when the um, Europeans took note of this fruit. Uh, William Bly, for example, uh, carried the aki plant along with Asian breadfruit uh, to the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew on his ship, the Providence, in 1793. Um, this is William Bly. A certain mutiny prevented him from actually delivering the, um, the breadfruit to Jamaica, mutiny on the bounty. 
but it, it, it did make it to all the way to Jamaica where it found um, a lot of skepticism. The slaves wouldn't eat it. They thought it was animal food, um, but eventually they did eat red fruit and red fruit becomes um, a wonderful combination with the salted cod because of its kind of bland nature, but it could similarly be um, resuscitated. So you dried your bread fruit into cakes, then soak them in milk, and then um, fry them fry them up as um, as cakes to serve with salt fish. So it's a it's a very similar kind of um, process. Uh, together with salt pork, salt meat, uh, usually salt beef, and in some places uh, the salt beef was nicknamed salt horse uh, on board ships. Um, the salted cod is used to flavor local foods. Its techniques of preservation, this idea of this reconstitution engineered in the kitchen, uh, were at the symbolic heart of the modern, early modern global experience. So, but the Europeans were not the only ones to go to sea. Let's look at the Chinese briefly. Um, between 1405 and 1433, the emperor of Ming China uh, sent out armadas of ships into the Indian Ocean. And here you see a model of uh, one of Columbus's ships compared to the size of the Chinese ship. The big ship is the Chinese ship. Uh, Zheng Ha was the admiral in charge of this fleet. He commanded the treasure fleet, which consisted of 62 ships. The largest of these were the Baoshan uh, treasure ships. Um, they were between 440 and 538 feet long, enormous, uh, over 200 feet wide, with four decks and nine masts, and rigged with square sails for uh, maneuverability in the Indian Ocean area, where uh, in southeast, uh, south, south China seas. Um, there were about 27,000 sailors, translators, cooks, other crew members on board these ships. So it was a huge undertaking to send the Armada out. And they went all the way to Africa, to the East African coast. Um, and there, one of the local kings sent back to the Emperor of China a gift of a giraffe, uh, which is recorded in this painting along with the horses that the Chinese carried. They carried drinking water and food and trade goods. Um, the ships even carried lumber on board them for repairs as they moved along. Um, just as European ships often had blacksmiths on board um, for repairs that were needed at sea. The ships communicated with one another, the Chinese ships, with flags and gongs and banners and lanterns lanterns and bells and carrier pigeons, um, and even the smaller sh uh, ships were more than twice the size of Columbus's flagship, the Santa Maria. Um, but most importantly, these ships um, and the ambassadors and emissaries that were part of the transactions in ports were essentially uh, sent out to bring tribute goods, and these included all sorts of precious Goods, um, wild animals, ostriches, zebras, camels, a giraffe. Um, but among the most precious goods were rare foods. Um, so, for example, swallows' nests, which were retrieved from sea cliffs in Southeast Asia, were brought back to the uh, royal palace uh, for the emperor and um, uh, to be made into soup for elite banquets. And this became a staple of a royal banquet to have a swallow's nest. Plants and animals were often carried on board. Um, ginger, of course, was a favorite plant grown on Chinese ships, and it prevented scurvy. Uh, the early botanical collections of Europeans and of uh, Asians alike give testimony to how valuable new plants might prove to be. And these ships were essentially floating gardens and experimental agricultural stations all wrapped into one maritime community. Uh, Eurasian ships, 
captains were bioprospectors. Um, they sought medicinal remedies, they sought new foods, um, and one of those was ginger, which of course was an interesting medicinal voyager um, in contrast to the Chinese use of ginger, of course, the Europeans relied on citrus, and so you have a whole British Navy um, becoming known as limeys because their grog was made with lime and lime juice and rum and water. And of course, one of the uh, popular fruits used to prevent scurvy was the cranberry, um, a fruit, as you know, native to um, many parts of North America um, and harvested long before Columbus's ships. Uh, large 100 pound barrels of cranberries packed in water were used and, and carried on board typically in the 19th century for maritime use. So eventually, I'm running out of time here, but eventually we've got Sir Francis Drake's 16th century provisions. Um, very much the same hard tack, salted fish, ale or wine, fermented drinks, uh, dried beans. Um, the next century, European provisioning laws um, started to take place and take effect, guaranteeing this, um, the amount of, of all of these foods. Um, uh, eventually, unique culinary flavors of different continents and regions began to circulate in the world's oceans. So, um, for example, ships carrying Asians, South Asians, uh, or uh, ships carrying Chinese had a different menu. Um, the Asian ships had rice and curry dictated as um, by the navies for provisions on board the ships. Um, ships carrying, transporting Africans had yams, um, had pepper on, on all of them. So we get uh, some um, conformity to what the stereotypes are for, um, for all of these foods. Uh, other goods like African rice carried in and changing the cuisines, um, not only the, the product itself, but also the, the techniques for um, making it, for growing rice, for harvesting rice and, and processing rice. Um, move from West Africa across the Atlantic into the American South, into the Carolinas um, and um, other parts of the South. So you have um, uh, remembering that the, the earliest settlers, immigrants traveling around the world, um, sharing one thing in common, um, this sea voyage experience. And we see this by following different food flavors that are common to different vastly different parts of the world. So the vinegary um, uh, adobo flavors that have peppers from the New World, vinegar techniques from Asia, often some soy sauce found in Havana, Cuba, very popular in the Philippines. So, so very different, completely different corners of the world, but the same maritime um, set of recipes and diets, um, what was shared were they were always, almost always salty and always, almost always vinegary um, because of the need for preservation at sea. In Hawaii, um, the Pacific waters invited and inspired a substitute for the codfish, um, in, which was native to the Atlantic. It was the salted salmon. And in the second volume of his travel narrative, George Vancouver, Vancouver was named after him, uh, he wrote in the 1790s about his observation of salt production in Hawaii. Quote, in about the middle of the village is a reservoir of salt water. The exposure to the sun soon causes evaporation and crystallization. They have large quantities equal in color and quality to any made in Europe. So along this northwest um, uh, Pacific coastline, his ships purchased fish. Uh, salmon from local fishermen, river, bay, sea fishing from their sturdy canoes. Vancouver and his men are then trading salmon for spoons, glass beads, cloth, um, sharing meals of salmon, sugar, and grog. Um, hence comes the famous Lomi Lomi. So Pacific Northwest salmon meets Hawaiian salt, 
and this was a match made in heaven. Ships from Vancouver, eventually carrying furs and salmon to Hawaii, bringing back Hawaiian laborers for Port Vancouver, um, salt and other provisions um, to supplement his uh, crew. They, of course, preferred, preferred uh, breadfruit, the taro, to wheat flour, and brought these new food waste into the Pacific Northwest. So very similar kind of use of, uh, like, like in the Caribbean, movement of labor, movement of foods in response. Um, so preserving and pickling the past um, really was essential. Um, the other favorite story is that of ketchup, um, where treating local and imported foodstuffs by uh, salting and brining and pickling helped preserve those foods. Um, they also created a taste for something that was salty or sour, um, not only in Caribbean foods or in Pacific Asian foods, but also in many different world cuisines. So very soon, sauces and gravies were being made from peppers and fruits and vegetables. They were swimming in these um, heavily salted solutions with vinegar added. Uh, you know, fast forward to the uh, fast food industry today and the amount of ketchup uh, being used by, I think the estimate is three bottles per person per year. Um, I, I'm not eating three bottles of ketchup, so somebody's eating three bottles of ketchup. Um, but here you have the recipe, and we can thank some Chinese traders probably, bringing a fish sauce from Vietnam to southeastern China, where the British Navy encounters it probably um, in, the, in the 17th or 18th century. By 1732, we have our first recipe called ketchup in paste. And this recipe had boiled beans, probably soybeans, we think. Um, and here the recipe says boil them and strain them until it becomes like butter. With ground spices, add nutmeg, cloves, mace, pepper, garlic, orange juice, or mango pickle. This being well mixed together makes an agreeable sauce. So what's missing from that recipe? Tomato ketchup um, only emerges in 1812. Um, Heinz ketchup produced from about 1876. Um, and as I said, we're now consuming 10 billion ounces of it. Uh, there was just a New York Times article about Ghana's embrace of, uh, in West Africa, their embrace of fast food and Kentucky fried chicken. Whoa. Um, these dishes, curry powder, chow chow, um, pickled um, chutneys. Um, these begin to appear in many different um, American cookbooks in the 19th century already. So, so already by the 1800s, you have a very global taste. A set of tastes, and, and likely not only because all of these settlers in the logging camps and the mining camps, um, the port cities, the new immigrants coming, being attracted um, to all of the new opportunities um, in the new world, in the United States and America. They are um, eating very, very um, boring provisions often that they've brought with them or that they're forced um, to uh, uh, eat as, as part of their labors. Um, and so these sauces, these pickles, these ketchups um, become very important ways of flavoring their food. And, and they obviously have a very global origin from South Asia, the Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia, from China, from the Caribbean, um, I see even your pickle recipe in the uh, exhibition upstairs on Agricultural Goose Day. There's a pickle recipe that has peppers. Um, so they're importing peppers, seeds to grow peppers, um, uh, from the Caribbean already by the early time of this 
place to be made. These pickles um, were found everywhere in this bay, the Great Lakes. There's my grandmother in the front, uh, uh, eating a watermelon in the bottom left, a horner. And she's, um, she's going to, after this picnic in 1911, on Boglo Island in the Leshino Islands of um, the Great Lakes, she's going to go and make uh, watermelon pickles out of the rind because this would be a souvenir of this day, how rare to have um, watermelon, which was, of course, domesticated in Africa, brought with the slave trade to the Americas, and um, success, most successfully grown and associated with African-American culture in, um, in the South. These um, flavors, uh, these foods, have an enduring quality um, through pickling and preserving the past. We have from the sea biscuits, um, lasting. Here's one that was, uh, I found in the museum, the Maritime Museum in Greenwich, uh, dated to 1784. <laughs> It all looks like new. <laughs> <laughs> and the flying fish. Um, now, not so common um, in, in the Caribbean. It used to be that you could really see them quite often. I understand there's a, there's a kind of flying fish off the coast here as well. Um, these seafaring diets provided a common experience for sailor and slave, for immigrant, for laborer. Um, those on land, those at sea. So whether from Africa's Gold Coast or the British Isles, the Great Lakes or the Pacific Ocean, the diet at sea on water was also an experience in shared communal worlds that provided a common vocabulary of ingredients. Um, through these expanding global encounters, the people of four continents cooked and ate meals in which cultural meanings were shared and created and sustained across generations. Um, this is our globalized food ways that, that we enjoy today. So both, I think, metaphorically um, and very much materially, uh, this culinary magic um, of every world region takes place in um, a big cauldron that we call modernity.